In chapter one, we're going to look at an introduction to the scientific method. Um, and uh, this is a topic that I know you've heard of in every science class that you've taken uh, because it's the basis of science. Uh, but before we actually look at the steps of the scientific method, uh, let's quickly look at the learning objectives that we're going to tackle in this chapter. Um, so in section 1.1, we're going to list the steps of the scientific method. We're going to define the hypothesis and describe its characteristics. We're going to describe what a scientific theory is. Uh, distinguish between inductive and deductive reasoning, and then finally we're going to explain why a hypothesis cannot be proven just by using deductive reasoning. So to begin with, uh, let's talk about what science is. So th the textbook says that science is by definition a body of knowledge. Now we know that this body of knowledge has many different fields. For example, the title of this class is biology, which is a field of science. Um, and in biology we're going to study living things. So when you look at um, the rest of the chapters in the textbook, we're going to be focusing specifically on living organisms and cells, uh, plants and animals and fungus and protists. But we know that biology is not the only field of science. Here at Wallace we also teach um, anatomy and physiology which focuses on the human body. Uh, we also teach microbiology that focuses on microorganisms like bacteria. Um, and then we also teach a, <clears throat> an organismal biology class that focuses on uh, specifically just plants and animals and ecology. So science is a very broad field. Uh, it's basically centered around discovering something either new uh, or something that is unknown. Now, in your textbook, um, they pose a simple question. Say that you have caught a cold. What advice have you received from friends and family to actually treat your cold? Now, many of you, uh, when you think of advice that people have given you to treat a cold, uh, may have thought of some of these things. You might have been told before to take vitamin C or drink orange juice, to use some type of, of cough drop, to drink herbal tea like echinacea tea, to meditate, to get some sleep, uh, maybe to dress warmer. Um, and then some of you may just been told, eat chicken soup, you know, uh, chicken noodle soup, uh, make you feel better. But as a true scientist, if you had a common cold, how would you go about figuring out which piece of advice would actually work best? And so what we're going to tackle in this chapter um, is that as a scientist, if posed with any kind of problem, you would always want to use the scientific method. Because what the scientific method allows us to do is to solve these problems and to answer these questions both efficiently and effectively. Uh, scientific method has four major steps. The first step is to make an observation. Second, use that observation to form our, or use those observations to form our hypothesis. To then experiment and test the hypothesis. And then finally to form the conclusion uh, whether to determine that your hypothesis has been supported or not. So what this chapter is going to focus on are these four steps and looking into detail at what is going on in each of these steps. So let's start with step one. We said step one was observations, <clears throat> making observations. So uh, by definition, an observation is, is just a statement about something that you've noticed. Um, a, another textbook defined observation as gathering info. Uh, now when we gather this info, uh, we're going to use <clears throat> any of our five senses. So this, this information may be something that we smell, or that we taste, that we touch, that we hear, or that we see. And then based on this observation, it leads us to questions or it leads us to problems. And then from there, we form our hypothesis. Now by definition, uh, the textbook says a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for what you have observed. You know, you probably have been told for years and years and years that a hypothesis is really just an educated guess, which is what it is. It's based on uh, prior experience and it's my best explanation as to why I have observed what I have observed. So let's look at an example uh, of where this might come into play. So let's say that your mom makes the observation that it's cold outside. So she probably uh, has, uh, has sensed the cool temperatures. And so based on that observation, your mom might pose or propose this hypothesis. Dressing warmly will help you avoid a cold because, you know, obviously, dressing warmly helps you uh, avoid a cold uh, because becoming chilled makes you more susceptible to illness. So she has prior experience that typically when you have a cold you have been chilled and so dressing warmer will prevent the chill which will prevent the cold. So this is her best proposed explanation of, of what she has observed. 
Now, a couple things that we know about hypotheses. First off, uh, a hypothesis must be testable. In other words, we have to be able to evaluate your hypothesis, to test it, in order to determine if it's supported or not, if you could be right or if you could be wrong. So testable, we have to be able to evaluate, but here's the key. You have to be able to evaluate it using the measurable universe. So it has to be something that we can actually collect numbers on, data on. Uh, so they mentioned in the book that supernatural reasons why things are caused, like if you were to say that it was caused by psychic energy, um, or if it were caused by, uh, if you believe in uh, religious things like God or something like that, that's not technically a scientific hypothesis because it cannot be tested through the measurable universe. Uh, the other qualifier to make it an actual scientific hypothesis is that it's falsifiable. So with any proposed explanation that you give, there has to be the potential that you could be wrong. Now, of course, there's the potential that you could be right, but there also has to be the potential that you could be, that you could be wrong. So let's read these four statements together and determine which one of these would fall into the category of being a scientific hypothesis. So statement A, jazz is better than rap music. B, garden fairies make tomatoes grow better. C, hunting species to extinction is wrong. Or D, increasing the amount of protein in a cow's diet increases milk yield. So after reading through those four, which one would you say is a scientific hypothesis? Well, I hope that you picked D. Because D is the only one that is both testable and falsifiable. If you look at letter A, jazz music is better than rap. Well, that's just an opinion. B, garden fairies make tomatoes grow better. That's supernatural. We can't really test garden fairies. Um, or C, hunting species to extinction is wrong. Again, that's also an opinion. So letter D would be the correct scientific hypothesis because it meets both requirements, both testable and falsifiable. So one of the other things that it mentions at the beginning of section 1.1 1 .1, uh, is the definition of a theory. Now the reason we bring these into play here is because a lot of people will use the term theory um, in relationship to a hypothesis. And so a couple things that we wanted to establish here. First off, everyday use of theory is not the same thing as a scientific theory. See, everyday use of the word theory, uh, we typically say, well, I have this theory, and it's typically something, that, an idea that has gone untested. Um, but an actual scientific theory, by definition, is a powerful, broad explanation of related observations. And the key with a scientific theory is it's something that actually has been tested, and it is well supported. Um, so for example, like the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution is not just an untested idea. The theory of evolution actually combines several hypotheses that have all been tested and have been supported. The cell theory, again, it's actually three separate hypotheses, three separate statements that have all been tested, that cells are the basic unit of life, that new cells come from pre-existing cells, um, that cells are, are, are the smallest, most structural unit of a living thing. So several hypotheses that when grouped together make the cell theory and they've all been well supported. So let's kind of put what we have established about observations and hypotheses into another example. So let's say that I make these three observations. One, fruits and vegetables contain much vitamin C. So this is something I've noticed. If I look on uh, the, the label of fruits and vegetables, I see that they contain a lot of vitamin C. Uh, let's say that I've also observed that people with diets rich in fruits and vegetables that contain vitamin C are generally healthier. So those that are eating oranges and apples and other fruits, they're, they're generally healthier. So observation three then, I also noticed that vitamin C is considered to be an anti-inflammatory and so by being an anti-inflammatory agent, it reduces throat and nose irritation. So these are three observations, three things that I have noticed. And so from these three observations, I then might form this hypothesis. That consuming vitamin C can decrease the, the risk of catching a cold. So this is my proposed explanation because I have observed several things about vitamin C. And so then I now form the explanation that if I consume vitamin C, it's going to help me decrease the risk of catching a cold. Now, this is known as inductive reasoning because what I've done is I've combined specific observations into a general principle. So I've taken three separate statements, three separate things that I've noticed, and I've brought them in, hence the word inductive, I've brought them into a general principle that I call my hypothesis. So inductive reasoning uh, is needed in order to establish 
the, uh, the uh, hypothesis. So is this hypothesis a scientific hypothesis? Well, we got to look. Does it meet the two qualifiers? Is it testable? Is it falsifiable? Could you test that consuming vitamin C decreases the risk of catching cold? You could. And is there potential that you could be wrong? Yes, there is. So we would consider this to be a scientific hypothesis. Now, in class, we're going to reiterate these terms by doing an activity called do B, C, and color. We're going to skip over that for now. Uh, but like I said, in class, be ready that at this point we will do uh, a learning activity. Now, where do we go from here? We said uh, the hypothesis was established using uh, the inductive reasoning method, but then there's also something known as deductive reasoning. See, what deductive reasoning then says is it's going to take your general principle and it's going to use it to predict some outcomes. And so what deductive reasoning does is it establishes these if-then statements. If you look at the side of the screen, and this is also in your textbook on page 7, we use the hypothesis consuming vitamin C reduces the risk of catching a cold. So from that statement, we can make a prediction then that if vitamin C reduces the risk of catching a cold, then people who take vitamin C supplements would receive fewer colds than those who don't. And so then we would test that prediction conducting an experiment where we uh, conduct an experiment where we survey to compare the number of colds in people who do take vitamin C supplements versus those that who do not. So the big difference here between inductive and deductive is inductive you take several statements and bring them into one general principle, whereas deductive reason you take that one principle and you use it to predict several different outcomes. Now, <clears throat> as far as these predictions are concerned, uh, the prediction is considered to be true uh, if the hypothesis is supported. But the key word here is it's not proven. So look over towards the right. If people who take vitamin C suffer fewer colds than those who do not, then we could conclude that the prediction is true. But if people who take vitamin C suffer the same number of colds or more, then you might conclude that your prediction was, was false. But one of the things that you have to consider here is you have to consider that there may be more than one hypothesis as to why these people have received fewer colds. In other words, my hypothesis may be supported by my experiment, but it may not necessarily be proven because that may not be the actual reason they receive fewer colds. See, we're saying here that vitamin C is what makes them have fewer colds, but it could just be the fact that the people are just healthier. Or there could be other variables to consider. So the prediction is true if the hypothesis is supported, but just keep in mind that does not necessarily mean that it is absolutely proven. Prediction is, is false, then your hypothesis is rejected, and you kind of have to start all over again. So really quickly, uh, just kind of a quick question here to see, make sure that we're all on the same page. So why is it impossible to say that the hypothesis that vitamin C, or to say that the hypothesis that vitamin C prevents colds is true? A, lab experiments are not practical. B, alternative hypotheses might be possible. C, experiments with humans are unethical. Or D, vitamin C cannot be obtained naturally. So why is our hypothesis on vitamin C not proven to be true? I hope you picked B because alternate hypotheses might be possible. So it may be supported but not necessarily proven to be true.